Welcome to the October Nashville Meet Me Call. Today's Meet Me Call will focus on the 2024 Technical Assistance Coalition paper titled Supported Employment to Foster Recovery, General Trends, Financing, and the Great Transformation for Transition-Aged Youth. This paper is part of the SAMHSA-funded 2024 Beyond Bed series, which includes 10 papers, several of which have been featured during the NASHBID 2024 annual meeting and the NASHBID Meet Me Calls. Supported employment, along with housing, can be instrumental in helping prevent crisis and helping people stabilize after crisis. We are honored to have the uh, authors of this paper present today. Dr. Vanessa Klodnik, Research Associate Professor, Dr. Deborah Cohen, Research Professor and Director of the Center for Youth and Mental Health, Rebecca Johnson, Senior Research Coordinator, and Abby Mayhew, Student and Research Associate from the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, Steve Hicks of School of Social Work at the University of Texas, Austin. Thank you all for being here today and for your contributions to this crucial work. Dr. Klodnik, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. We were so honored to write this paper, and we had a lot of fun doing it. We learned a lot. Uh, we're, we're an interesting group of people. Um, we have a lot of lived experience and practice experience in supporting the implementation of supported employment, as well as studying it, evaluating it, growing it, and sustaining it across community mental health providers in the U.S., um, next slide, please. So today you're gonna hear from all of us. We're each gonna introduce ourselves um, as we uh, present our slides. And just to say quickly a little bit um, about me and, and our team is that we have specific expertise in adapting and enhancing supported employment for transition age youth with serious mental health conditions. This is important to know because it is our perspective and our experience. We've had to really learn and understand supported employment in order to enhance it, implement it, study it. So we've really had to get in there and understand it from multiple perspectives. And I think that you're gonna see this and hear this from us today, as well as in the report. We also today cannot feature everything that's in the report. And so I just wanna tell you that when that comes out, you're gonna be able to, you'll be able to um, learn more about some of the things that we discuss. Next slide, please. So part of why we have this very unique perspective on supported employment is because of the work we've done and are currently doing in who we've partnered with. Before I joined UT Austin last year, I worked at Thresholds in Illinois, the largest community mental health provider in the state. I was there for 17 years leading research and evaluation in the youth services division. And then we partnered with nationally and internationally recognized supported employment researchers and also the University of Massachusetts Transition to Adulthood Center for Research to combine supported employment and education. We're gonna to get to that towards the end of our presentation today. Um, but we together throughout our work, we're engaging in research with community providers and state systems. We are also um, conducting program evaluation and process evaluations to better understand how supported employment is working for what populations and why. We're also engaged in supporting organizations to use continuous quality improvement and use data to improve programs and policies to increase access to supported employment, as well as, this is my favorite little new project we've got going on, using measurement-based care dashboards and tailoring them for the supported employment specialists and the clinicians so that we can improve supported employment, I'm gonna say service delivery and outcomes. Also, our group is heavily involved in, in, a, in a, um, I think a foundational practice principle of our research and our partnership is partnering with people with lived experience and leveraging the expertise of people who have serious mental health conditions and who have, support, have engaged in supported employment all of our work aims to translate information to answer questions that are for practical use to how do we help state systems increase supported employment access? How do we improve the experiences of people in supported employment? And so at this point, I think I think it's 12 states we've worked with of different agencies within states to specifically help them with supported employment and supported education. Again, from this transition age youth angle. Next slide, please. I wanna quickly thank NASHBED, SAMHSA, and all of you. 
that are part of this, I'm going to say shift in embracing this idea that employment is a social determinant of health for adults with serious mental health conditions in your work and expanding and bringing supported employment to your state systems and to your agencies. I also just want to say, we can't write these reports. We can't give these presentations if it wasn't for the hundreds of thousands of people across the world who've engaged in supported employment and participated in research and program evaluation. Thank you to everyone who's participated in these services. Next slide, please. Quick disclaimer, in case something comes out of my mouth that shouldn't, the views, opinions, and content expressed today in this presentation do not necessarily reflect NASHBID, SAMHSA, our, our research funders, or our employer, UT Austin. Next slide, please. Okay, so today, my goal is for everyone here to leave with a deeper understanding of what supported employment is. I also want us to leave with this, I'm going to say inspiration, maybe a, a feeling of, my goodness, I need to work as a state leader with other state leaders in different departments to increase access to supported employment. So this really about collaboration is so incredibly important so we can increase access. And also because we have this expertise in transition age youth supported employment, we want to bring to you some of the innovation in that area today. Next slide. So what is supported employment? And you'd be surprised when I'm out, out about in the country, how people have interpreted this in different ways. And in fact, in preparing this report, people do interpret it in different ways. Every state, different counties, cities, people have different definitions of supported employment. At the end of the day, it's a set of services or a variety of services that support individuals with significant disabilities, in this case, serious mental health conditions, in obtaining, maintaining, and advancing in employment. And this isn't any kind of employment. This is competitive employment. This is These are in jobs that are at least minimum wage and that are available to the general population. These are not jobs that are set aside for people with disabilities. These are not sheltered workshop opportunities. These are jobs that anyone can get access to and, and could earn a live, or excuse me, a minimum wage. What's really important here is that supported employment at the end of the day is a public health service. Supported employment is about promoting inclusion in the labor market. Supported employment is about that labor market um, participation is community participation and community integration. And that is foundationally and fundamentally important in supporting the recovery of um, individuals with serious mental health conditions. Now, here's the things that I think are really interesting. And I wouldn't have been able to say this to y'all like maybe even five years ago, but this point of doing so much implementation work in supported employment, I can tell you that supported employment has these principles that are, they're, they're not principles, they're philosophies that drive what it is. And one of them that is so important is this notion that every person diagnosed with a serious mental health condition can work. And if you're a champion of support employment, like I am, part of your job is explaining this to people. And in our report, we talk about this, how we really, there's plenty of research showing this. We know that employment really matters in the lives of um, individuals with serious mental health conditions. Employment decreases psych hospitalizations. It decreases symptom-related distress. It improves quality of life. We know this, but we have a, um, a lot of work to do to continue educating and advocating for our community mental health and also state leaders across departments to see employment as really important. Another thing that's really key in supported employment is we don't wanna exclude people from the labor market. We don't wanna put barriers up. We don't wanna create a lot of job readiness trainings that prevent people from connecting to the labor market. We wanna get them into the labor market so they can experience employment. And here's the thing that maybe your mind will be blown, like maybe mine was a few years ago. But I'm like, oh, the intervention isn't supported employment services or vocational rehabilitation services. The intervention is employment. Employment is the critical intervention here. And supported employment services support people with serious mental health conditions in engaging in employment, in all the things that come with employment. Think about how employment structures your day, helps you figure out who you are, inspires you to do new things. You learn and grow through employment. Incredibly important. Employment is the intervention. It's the special sauce, as some people we know say. Next slide. 
So I can't talk about supported employment without saying something about these eight principles. They're really important. I've already kind of talked about a few of them, but there's a couple I want to mention, highlight how tricky they are, and also to tell you to go read our report because we're going to talk a little, we talk a little bit about these and how to best do these. Um, the first one is integration. So integrating supported employment with clinical care, with community mental health services. This would mean that supported employment services, a specialty service, is delivered by a person who's a supported employment specialist who is valued equally on the team or on the program as other people, such as psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and social workers. And they, they together, the supported employment specialist and my favorite, right, the clinical folks have to partner and they partner together to support the employment goals of individuals with, with serious mental health conditions. This collaboration piece is tricky. There's a lot of research still documenting this is tricky. And so this is something that we are figuring out. And if you read our report, there's some suggestions and some um, model programs that have and states that have done a great job with integration. The other one I wanna highlight is job development. Now this one became, it was added with the advent of the most evidence-based of supported employment models, the IPS model or the individual placement and support model. Um, What's interesting about job development, it's so funny, I just did a training on job development. I'm like, who knows what job development is? People are like, I know, and no one knew. The deal is, is it's getting out of the office and it's that supported employment specialist building connections, relationships, and partnerships with employers. It's not providing a service to an individual. You can bring an individual with you, your client with you and do this. That's one way to bill Medicaid for it. Um, however, this often gets left off. It's like the, the, the principal that is most or the fidelity item on the IPS scale that folks struggle with. It's hard to get out of the office. It's hard to develop relationships with employers. It takes a certain skill set. And I think that's just an interesting and important, if you know support employment, knowing that job development is part of it is really key. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So to talk a little bit about this integration and what this looks like, if you look at this diagram, now, depending on the size of a community mental health organization and how supported employment is funded at your state um, or county or city, it can look different. But I'm going to give one kind of common example of how supported employment is integrated in a community mental health setting. You'd have a supported employment team, and that team would have a team leader, right? And their job, this team, is to do high fidelity, good supported employment services and to have the actual supported employment specialists embedded in the programs or a couple of teams that are serving individuals with serious mental health conditions. So this idea of we're not going to ask staff who are, let's say, um, case managers or care coordinators or clinicians to do supported employment. We're going to have a separate team and that team is going to focus on that because Employment often gets left off on the clinician's radar. Um, it still, we have a lot of work of helping folks and educating folks. And one of our recommendations in the report is that we in, increase and improve the familiarity and value that clinical mental health professionals have around employment for individuals with serious mental health conditions and the valuing and knowing of the evidence base behind supported employment, which is expansive. Now, I can't tell you, I'm a social worker by training, the number of social workers I've met even recently that are like, I don't know anything about support employment or peer support, I'll, I'll add. Don't know much about these two things, but these people are in my environment, right? And we need to be really training our mental health workforce to know that supported employment is a, an evidence-based practice. I also wanted to mention, so IPS SE, IPS Supported Employment has a fidelity scale. The IPS Works website has fantastic resources. I want to point you over to them. They are powerhouse researchers and have fantastic practice guides for states and have lots of suggestions on how to braid funding, which my colleague Debbie will get to in just a moment. The other thing I wanted to mention was customized employment which I think certain states are doing it a lot with IDD populations. It's interesting because it's happening within supported employment and community mental health. And this is the thing that happens when you have a supported employment specialist who's working with a person with serious mental health condition and the employer to carve out a job and job responsibilities that are best suited for the person with a disability who and their competencies and their strengths and also is filling the needs of an employer. So it's creating positions that fit both needs, the employer's needs and the person with serious mental health conditions needs. And that is a, a definite skill set and a practice 
um, that I, I just, I think it's great. I think it's great for our transition age youth. I also think it's tricky. Next slide, please. I wanted to say just a big shout out to many states who are on here. There's so many people doing incredible work. I must just say, once again, every state structures how they um, support, train, monitor, implement supported employment across their state in the way that they partner with community mental health organizations. Typically, one common model is that the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation will provide some services as well as individual services, actually. They'll have their own teams of employment specialists or vocational rehabilitation specialists who are providing supported employment. Also, that vocational rehabilitation department will contract with community mental health agencies and they'll have those supported employment teams that are delivering within the agency. And so I just wanted to give you all a shout out in our report, we talk more about the different examples. Next slide, please. And finally, just some resources for you. The report has so many resources. We have many links. Um, I had to just say SAMHSA is coming out with a new supported employment guide. This old one we have a link to, it's still fantastic. It outlines how to do it, not why do it, how to do supported employment, how to make it work in your setting. Then also, as I said before, the IPS Employment Center at Westat, tons and tons of resources, an international learning community, really fantastic. And then also I'm gonna give a shout out to our work. So we've done a lot of work on uh, maintaining high fidelity to IPS supported employment, but um, changing some practices and the way we engage transition age youth and support them um, around the, I'm gonna say lots of developmentally relevant education um, that needs to be engaged in as well as um, uh, part-time short-term employment. And so we have a ton of resources there. Um, I think I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague now, Debbie. Uh, next slide. So I'm uh, Dr. Debbie Cohen. I um, particularly focus on the intersection of health services research and policy. The one thing that we've learned over time is that you have to have a good handle over understanding disability policy, mental health, justice, education, all the sort of like different avenues of state and federal law in order to help um, all of our different partners implement um, these practices. And the biggest thing with supported employment as any, there's probably plenty of people on this call who are, who are experts in disability policy is the reality with vocational rehab is it exists across different parts of federal law. So some of this pops up in education law and IDEA about transition services. Other parts fall, fall, um, pop up in the Rehab Act, and then how all that gets implemented at the state level looks different. As a result of that, um, a number of different agencies can struggle to uh, hire, maintain, and sustain the role of supported employment specialists, which lead to not as many people getting supported employment services as we would like. So our biggest plug on this is just saying that we encourage all of you, we're very happy that you came to listen to us talking, but it's just saying in order to be successful and really rolling out a strong supported employment approach within your state, it's gonna take a lot of cross system leadership to think through how you braid and blend funds across all these different um, policies. Next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of explanation on state vocational rehab departments. So as I said, some of this, this is, you know, just like a lot of things in mental health, there's different structures at the federal level, and then each states have their ability to make decisions about how they want to implement it at their state level. <clears throat> Currently, how vocational rehab is structured um, is it's separated in two different groups. So we have something that's called pre-employment transition services. Some people will call this pre-ETS. And it's specifically for individuals who are 14 to 25 year olds. This is where I'm talking about where it interacts with education law and education policy is that a lot of these programs are interwoven within uh, your high schools, uh, special education, community colleges. Um, a lot of those programs are filtered into that. And then there's the traditional VR services, which is what a lot of us have interacted with if we worked in community mental health center. 
is these are looking at individuals who are already been diagnosed with a serious mental illness. They're likely already on uh, SSI, and then we are helping them to get back to work. And that is the funding mechanism that a lot of us have already interacted with. The reason why we bring up these two different things is because the services and the qualifications to get access to this different funding looks different. On the uh, transition age youth aid uh, bracket of funding, that tends to be a little bit more flexible, flexible and less dependent upon diagnosis versus traditional VR services are very directed at someone having a diagnosed disability, whether that is serious mental health condition, intellectual disability, TBI, a number of different things, physical impairment. Um, but we like to point out those things of just realizing that we need to think through, especially when we're talking about this age group, how you might have different rules and actually it might be a little bit more flexible. Okay, next slide. Okay, so as I was saying, it's really complicated, it's really complex. So I have worked at different levels. I've been at the agency level. Now I spend a lot of time consulting with county level and state level individuals. But how, depending upon how your state is structured, typically what it looks like on the agency level is that we will have contracts with our state vocational rehab office, and then we will be paid for milestone achievement. This could be something like that they um, have uh, obtained a job, they've kept a job, and these are lump sums, which look different than if we would be billing Medicaid for individual services. So your funding mechanism looks different. So getting at the agency level, you have to make sure that you have a CFO who is on board with how funds would be coming into your agency in a different sort of fashion because you're getting paid after you met milestones versus getting paid directly for a service that happened that day. There's going to be more of a lag. It's also that this isn't going to be set up in your electronic health record in this way. You know, we've created all these electronic health records to look at typical medical billing. This is billing in a different sort of way. So you have to make sure that you have the structures in place from the financial and billing perspective that an agency feels comfortable enough in order to take that risk that they feel that they're able to capture those funds in order to cover the cost of salary. So while we're trying, you know, being really focused upon wanting to get these services to these individuals, there's a lot of different things that come from a bureaucratic perspective and a financial perspective that we have to think through about how those processes look in order to make sure that the funds are coming to the agency and they can cover all their costs. Um, I will go to next slide before I start. Okay. These are just gives you a few examples, but in next slide, I want to talk about waivers and how this interacts with all this. Okay. So I assume everyone on the call has Medicaid waivers. Um, I forget how many we currently have active in the state. I think I looked at the number, or currently in the nation. When I think when we were writing this, I looked it up what we're at right now. Between 1959 and 1915 C waivers. Okay, so when I reviewed a lot of the waivers that are currently out there within all the many states that are represented on the call, for the most part, everyone is including supported employment services on this. But what I add back into this is there is also a number of different complex situations that the agency will experience if they're treating someone on one of these waivers. I can give the example that specifically on our, our we call it the yes waiver in the state of Texas, is for our individuals who are youth who we are trying to keep out of a psychiatric hospital, so it serves up to age 19, we do include supported employment services for the teenagers on that. However, we require that the individual has to go to the vocational rehab office, they have to go through a um, uh, assessment, and then determinations happen before they can be referred back to the community mental health center for them to be able to bill for those specific services. So there's a lot of different layers to all these sort of things that make these more complicated from an agency perspective to roll out all these sort of things. And I know you guys don't have full 
control over all these different rules and regulations. I just encourage everyone to think about how complicated this is and um, being prepared to support agencies when we're asking them to roll out these programs that we really, really value. It's just really complicated from a process perspective. The other thing that I wanna flag for you guys on the IDD side is that a number of our states are currently going away with the sub-minimum wage. Um, it's been outlawed in a number of different states, including Texas. There's a bill that keeps on coming up in the federal level and it keeps on not getting the vote. But just knowing there's bigger conversations happening on the IDD side of the house, and I know you guys usually are in the same office at the state level, but just the same, there's a lot of conversation right now about supported employment and discussing how they move those individuals to competitive work or job carve outs. So there's a lot of opportunities right now to work partner with individuals. Um, at our state level because they're trying to figure out how to revamp all their services right now. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the last thing I want to cover is the big thing in community mental health this day, these days are certified community behavioral health centers. And supported employment is a part of that, but it's still a bit of an unknown to know exactly how all that's being rolled out and how the funding looks like. So this is I guess, basically our plug to say that we're really interested to learn and figure out what states are doing regarding uh, supported employment, also just generally about early intervention and transition age youth. I know that I've talked to a number of different of our community mental health providers in the state of Texas and talking about all the different new things that they're trying. Um, and we don't feel like a lot of that's being tracked in a way that we'll be able to celebrate all the new cool things that people are doing. So we just wanna put a plug out there to all of our state leaders to say that we wanna hear about all the new exciting things that uh, states are doing. And if we can be helpful in any way to help you guys track it um, and figure out whether research program evaluation, you know, or figuring out the best data, if you only can pick one variable to track, like we're here to support it. Um, and now I'm going to kick it to Abby. Thank you. Uh, hi, y'all. I'm Abby Mayhew. I'm a research associate and master's student um, at the uh, at working for UT. So uh, I or, sorry, next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transition age youth specifically. So we've been talking this whole time about supported employment, and uh, it's really important and crucial to adapt it to this transition age youth, very specific population. Um, transition age youth includes 16 to 25 year olds. Um, and this population has very, very specific needs and culture and values that are very distinct and different from child services and adult services. Um, developmentally, they essentially bridge the gap between child and adult services. Um, so when we're talking about recovery, as far as in the in the framework of adult services, um, recovery infers that we that that the goal of treatment is to return back to a, a previous level of functioning or a previous state um, within their adult life. So when we apply this to transition age youth, it doesn't exactly work the way that uh, the way that it would for adult services because transition age youth are not quite children and not quite adults. Um, so we like to uh, adapt a framework around discovery because transition age youth are discovering who they are for the first time. They are discovering their identity. They're um, discovering what and really formulating what who they want to be in the world, what they like to do, and how and how they'll work out further into their adult life. Um, so if we adapt this element of discovery and uh, identity development, education and employment goals are major, major points of that. So education and employment are critical for exploring both expanding and deepening those uh, identity development. So um, for transition youth specifically, support and employment can really, really influence their development, um, both personally and within the world and within the uh, education and employment systems. Another aspect about this population that's really important to note is that instability and self-stigma are very, very uh, prominent within this population. So instability of um, the thing, the reason that supported employment would be very, would be very influential for this and very specific for this population is that uh, 
getting involved in education and employment systems would kind of increase that that stability level and also provide that confidence around learning what they like to do, um, learning what they're good at, learning what they what they want to expand on and what to what to continue with uh, further into their adult life. So um, for transition age youth specific services, supported employment is really, really influential and quite critical for uh, not only learning about themselves and learning uh, in this discovery aspect, um, but also becoming a person on top of uh, navigating their own serious mental health conditions. Um, next slide, please. So some recommendations that we have for transition age youth and supported employment um, come from a lot of different modes of research. But the first uh, that I want to mention is that there was an there, extensive um, evaluation of Australia's Headspace program, uh, specifically around supported employment. So some recommendations that this research came, came with is that to uh, to adapt to transition age youth needs specifically in a way that's feasible and, and uh, helpful to them actually, is to provide different types of support based on, based on those needs. So including volunteer uh, opportunities, time bound work experiences, internships, um, create, really diversifying the amount of experience that they gather to extend, to expand and deepen this uh, identity development. So having a lot of different options and then um, proceeding forward uh, in, in a number of ways that would work well for them um, and adapt to this flexibility that transition age youth really requires. Um, another recommendation is to employ strategies for uh, supporting them in disclosing mental health conditions. So similar to what Vanessa mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, well, a lot of the goal is, is integrating um, employment, educa employment education with treatment. Um, so that's a major aspect uh, that was found in Australia is the implementation around, disclos around disclosing um, mental health conditions within employment and education is also really important. Um, I'm going to pass over to Rebecca Johnson. Hello, I'm Rebecca Johnson. I'm a research coordinator um, at the University of Texas School of, within the School of Social Work. Um, I We're going to talk a little bit about how and what these kind of integrations look like for transition age youth. So one of the big things that we think about all the time is that recommendations for transition age youth go beyond that typical place and train approach that you often see in supported employment. It's about integrating that career development focus, helping young people not only get back into some into work and start working, but exploring what they want their careers to look like, what work might look like for them throughout the rest of their lives. Um, we're also really focused on making sure that technology is being leveraged to provide in the moment troubleshooting encouragement. We're talking about texting. We're talking about um, virtual services, virtual training opportunities, as well as preparing young people for how the workforce is changing and becoming. There's all sorts of jobs now that are also available to be working remotely, and we want young people to be prepared for what that might look like. Um, we're also very interested in integrating key supports involving important people in these services as part of like kind of those recommendations for transition age youth support employment. This could be caregivers, this could be mentors, this could be helping them connect with adults that are important to, that, to them or even just learning from those adults in those career exploration conversations. And the other third, the fourth thing is integrating near age peer support. So this is something that um, that we're seeing now across the country is more and more um, the peer support workforce is increasing. And the peer support can be so important in employment because we're, we want young people to have the opportunity to work with peers that can validate and understand their needs and experiences in work as well as in life. And we can help guide them through some of those next steps. Um, next slide, please. Some of the two main integrations of supported employment and supported education that we're seeing um, that's impacting this transition age youth population. The first being that IPS supported employment now includes, has a young adult that includes supported employment and supported education. So we've seen updates to manuals and fidelity scales and trying to make sure that these things are publicly available. There's states that are adopting this new fidelity scale to make sure that they're supporting this population. And the support education is designed for post-secondary 
um, and not just secondary education to try to help those high school students, those GED completers connect with whatever their next phase is. Um, so we have a link in there. There's gonna be some links through these next couple of slides that will help y'all be able to learn more about some of the things that we're talking about. And all of this is also expanded in the paper. Um, the second area is supportive employment education integrated role. So this is one role that is doing both supportive employment and support education. This role seems to be co coming up in a lot of different areas. We're seeing this in our early psychosis coordinated specialty care teams across the country. Um, we're seeing this in multidisciplinary mental health teams that are focused on working with transition age youth. So as Abby was saying, um, services that are bridging that gap between childhood and adult services, and also in some integrated youth and young adult mental health clinics. Um, one we'd like to shout out is our Amplify Clinic in Austin, Texas, that we expand on a little bit in the paper as well. Um, there's also some states like Colorado that are trying to expand what this model looks like and what this integration looks like for them. But these are just some areas that this is starting. Next slide, please. And then we're looking beyond supportive employment and supportive education for transition age youth. So these are some programs that are going beyond what we're used to seeing, going beyond that transition, that typical supported employment experience that we've been watching change over time for many, many years. And some of this is, these are enhancements to IPS or enhancements to supported employment, offering another way for young people to gain access to work in a way that is empowering and inspiring for them. So we have the height model as a great example. This is out of is being implemented in Massachusetts. They include five pillars of cognitive skill trainings. It's very focused on um, supported education, helping young adults explore what their career expert ex ex experiences will be and helping them to navigate and continue to explore what they want for their lives and moving forward. Then we have the career opportunity readiness experience model that we call CORE. This is a enhancement to IPS and it includes interactive workshops and paid part-time short-term internships to help um, young people get some in vivo work experience and also a space to like learn and grow together. We also have newer projects that are coming up like UMass Transitions to Adulthood ACR, which is, has some included policy and practice guidelines for transition age youth support employment and SAMHSA's Transition Age Youth Support Employment Policy Academy, where five states have different strategic plans to improve these transition age youth support employment implementation. So this is a growing part of our field that we're very excited about and that is so important that we're integrating all the things that are needed to support this population while we're navigating, while they're navigating work and school. And we want to see where this goes in the next several years and beyond. Um, yes, thank you all so much for your time today. I think that we are moving into, um, we're gonna transition into question and answer section for our time today. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Klodnik and Dr. Cohen and Rebecca and Abby. Um, just fantastic information. Um, I also love the idea of recovery to discovery, um, how easy that is to remember. And it just the paradigm makes sense for, for all of us, really, right? Uh, but especially uh, transition-aged youth. Um, so just some questions. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. How are most states based on your research dealing with the staff shortages with vocational rehabilitation counselors that are in place to work with the various community uh, partners facilitating IPS supported employment? That is a fantastic question. And 
to be honest with y'all, it was not one of our main focuses of our report. Now, that being said, we know from partnering with community mental health providers who are implementing supported employment across the country, how high the turnover is in this particular role. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And there are some, I'm going to say some innovative practices that I've seen. I feel like my colleagues also could, could add to this. One thing that's coming up a lot, and I'm excited about it, but also a little apprehensive, is around increased focus of uh, training and preparing the peer support workforce to provide supported employment and education. I think that it's smart. I've seen this in states. There's a certificate, I think, in, even in Illinois. Uh, my Illinois colleagues can weigh in on the chat. I kind of want to throw this back to folks who are participating today. If you're doing something innovative in your state in regards to addressing the shortage of vocational rehabilitation specialists and supported employment specialists and any efforts that you have, please add to the chat. Um, one thing that comes up consistently, of course, is pay, and that's tied to funding and how complicated all that is. Debbie, do you want to add to that? Before yeah, I, I was just going to add, um, and we're learning more and more, but in the state of Texas, we're in the process of rebuilding all of our very, very old state hospitals. And as a part of that conversation in all those different regions, we're having a lot of big conversations about workforce. Um, and uh, West Texas so far is winning. If they've created an entire pipeline that goes from psych techs all the way up to psychologists, I don't know if psychiatrists are part of it yet, but they're building curriculum and everything. They're working with their community colleges. They're working with their four-year institutions. So it's one of those things where it's, it's not fixed yet, but we're really excited to see how some communities are coming together and trying some innovative things. One of the things that they're trying that we're curious to try and are if they're doing some post- um, program fellowships. They're getting people to pay for fellowships for these new grads after they finish their bachelor's degree, master's degree, other things. So that's how they're, and it's like a carrot or we're doing some loan repayment. We're, they're, we're trying all these different carrots. <laughs> it's not a perfect solution, but I am excited to see. But some of these things like literally just launched in our state in the last couple of months. So we don't have data yet to see if it's actually been successful. I want to add that it's creating community amongst your uh, employment specialists and your voc rehab specialists that they are connecting. And so state conferences, state uh, learning collaboratives, IPS has an international learning collaborative. They also have affinity groups. This is a tricky role. I was hoping I'd get the opportunity to say something about this. So here we go. It's a tricky role because we're asking people not just to provide services to an individual with serious mental health condition, but we're also asking this person to deal with the public and to go out and job develop, develop relationships with employers. And at the end of the day, you know, we can't control what employers are going to say to our staff. They might say things that are absolutely horrendous and harmful and traumatizing and ableist. And, you know, and so a lot of my training has been to help staff learn how to respond to that in the real world. But I think we have to create not just training, but also training supervisors and, and increasing um, the capacity of supervisors to help their staff navigate the real world microaggressions of, of helping someone get a job. Um, it's hard that that process is tricky. And then it's also the big piece of this is it's helping them keep the job. So it's, it's maintaining that relationship with that employer and that person with a serious mental health condition and helping them to be successful. And, you know, staff need people to process stuff like that and they need their peers. And so anytime that there's an opportunity at your agency or state to bring people together who are doing the work, I've been fortunate to do this in different places. And when you get folks who are doing this work together, they have ideas, they also share, they share it's hard and then they validate each other and then they feel a sense of, I'm part of something bigger. Like I'm part of something that's bigger than just helping this individual person. We're actually transforming the mental health system. We're putting employment as a really important, I'm gonna say focus of recovery and healing and discovery that that's, imp that's important. And I think when you get people together and they feel like they're part of something bigger that can help combat, I'm gonna say burnout and then also the turnover. Not perfect, I do, better pay is I, I think ideally and then career ladders. 
figuring out how to increase, um, I'm going to say the implementation of supported employment. I know we had it on a slide earlier that only it's estimated only 2% of the people who want supported employment are able to access it. And so that's actually like, we need more supported employment specialists doing this. Um, but yeah, those are some of like the things I've seen. The other, that peer workforce piece, y'all, I think is really, it could be, it, it it's a potential way to address this, but not always. And I see in the chat, there's some folks that, who are who have tried to kind of combine the supported employment role and the peer role, and it hasn't worked. And I'm, I want to say you're not alone. Yeah, and I did want to ask, there's a question about funding for youth or young adult for IPS. So I'd say we have been on a varied adventure of what we've um, encountered with different projects. So um, we have tried working with some community mental health providers to look at using this standard VR milestone process, which for some centers, if they're already like really doing it a lot, they did well. The ones that was new, they really, really struggled um, and stopped doing it. Um, I can even tell you from personal experience that we're exploring this too of like my young adult clinic and it, it, it does not have the payoff for us. We don't do enough. We don't serve enough people with it. So it's like trying to figure out like what makes sense from a workload perspective for our finance staff. Um, so it's our larger centers, definitely in Texas, that we found that they're the ones that they have the capacity to build for the milestones and keep it going. And when I was based in Indiana within a center, I know that we did the same thing, but it was because we had a very large team. So the one thing that we found that been more successful has been, um, so especially like in first steps of psychosis, a lot of those sort of programs are using block grant funds where it's almost like fee for service or they're giving a chunk of money. They've been finding that they have more success at implementing supported employment because there's less of all the um, complications on making sure all the financing works. So my encouragement, because I know that all you guys at least are talking to your VR partners in your state, looking at what their WIOA plans are, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, that's what covers that like 14 to 25 year olds on VR. Like there are specific plans each state has to put out there. And some states have decided that they would do some grant mechanisms. And I think that that's more helpful is figuring out how to actually like pay for some of these staff members on the front end um, is the carrot that these agencies need to get it off the ground. It's just, you know, it's just really hard from a risk, financial risk perspective. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to note that uh, Deb Davidson says uh, in Kentucky, several of our community mental health centers have different names for the IPS uh, supported employment program, like Employment Connection, so the employment specialists can make connections without facing that stigma. That's interesting. Language matters, right? How Language matters. Been, yeah. Stigma is real. It's really real. We may live and breathe like we we're aware of strengths based approaches and person first language. Yeah, the the real world, not so much some, but you, I mean, yeah. And I will say one of the other things uh, that um, I don't know if we're doing it anymore, but in Waco, when they had a uh, federal system of care grant, uh, they um, use their system of care um, consortium, like the big group com committee governance board, they had businesses on that. And that's actually how they figured out how to do job development for their transition age youth, was they leveraged those sort of conversations as a way to bring in more for-profit businesses into the conversation about youth mental health. And that ended up spurring a bunch of job development without us sending out staff members. Um, they found that was the most successful way to do it in their community. That is great. Um, you may have already touched on this, but could you talk a little bit more about how to support staff when they go out there? Um, I think you said, you know, keep them connected in that, but can you talk a little bit more on how to support the workforce? Yeah, I think that inevitably the workforce being just as important as the clients or the service participants in this case. And when you're thinking about 
designing effective employment invoke rehab services and you're training people to interact with the community, it's recognizing that the wellness and resilience of the staff has to be put as a, as a priority. And that's a shift, I think, in a lot of places and spaces, maybe not so much after in the wake of COVID, but just shifting that and thinking about how do we create ways that workforce that's out there in the world is able to come back to the clinic or the center and make sense of what they're experiencing, learn from each other. Because every every interaction is different, right? Every context, every employer, there's different in the employee. I mean, think of like many of the jobs, man, we didn't really talk about this. So something we've talked about in the report is that you know, support employment has been really helpful in, in get, helping people get minimum wage jobs, which isn't necessarily enough to get out of poverty and also can be very stressful because the hours can maybe change every week. And that's hard. It's hard for a lot of reasons. And so it's, I, I think it's getting, how do I say this, um, greater understanding and valuing of the supported employment, not just as a service, but like what it's doing and how it's operating. And there's this kind of um, thing that's happens. I can only speak from my own experience around where it's like, well, if we do that, then what are we doing for the clinicians? Or what are we doing for this? And there's definitely a thing that happens in community mental health centers. And I'm saying this all across the country that I've seen of a, what's the right word for this? Like a, there's a power differential between the people on the team especially if and we're very well-versed in multidisciplinary care and coordinated special care and ACT models, and they all have support or they all have a support employment specialist embedded, but that person tends to have some of the least experience in mental health. And we don't want them to have a lot of experience in mental health. We want them to come and see someone as, wow, you look like you could do great at a job. Let's work together. Let's figure out what you're interested in. Let me help you connect to employers. It's not about, wow, I'm seeing symptoms here. That we need to treat those before you get the job. And so we want pe we want to attract a workforce that's aware of mental health, aware of trauma, but not using that as their lens by which they do the work. And I think that's really tricky for supervising. And one thing we've run into, and I love that there's coordinated specialty care folks that are on this call. One thing is really tricky. Those teams, if you don't have a big enough agency that has its own supported employment department, its own employment department, those teams are managing the supported employment education specialist. And guess what that worker ends up doing? A lot of case management that's related to everything. Maybe a little bit of employment education, but they end up doing a lot of things and they become unfortunately clinicalized, right? So this is still happening where it's like, well, no, like we all need to be on the same page about the clinical profile and the clinical needs. And it's like, well, no, we need to be priv or privileging and what does the young person or the person prefer and want and goals. And those, it can be a little tricky, right? So you need, one more thing I would say is you need strong team leaders. I just want to put a push, like a, a big plug for the, the training of team leaders and managers who are overseeing multidisciplinary programs. It's a unique set of skills to get people to work together who have different priorities and different backgrounds and different trainings. And I think that our field needs to move to better prepare folks instead of just popping them into <laughs> supervisor and program manager positions because there was turnover. And I think we saw that a lot of COVID. We have a lot of green staff who are in, I'm going to say like introductory team lo leader level and then manager who might not have a lot of experience of facilitating multidisciplinary clinics. And stop the other thing that I would add is uh, some other things we've done is that our state does grand rounds for our medical directors, for um, community mental health centers. I assume most states do this, um, but we would encourage exposing your psychiatrist to a lot of these psychiatric rehab sort of approaches. Um, we have it a part of for our medical students. We do a little exposure at Dell Medical School, um, training them so they know about peer support. They know about supported employment. They know about clubhouses. They know about all these more non-traditional stuff so that they've heard about this and that they we can turn them into um, bigger advocates for bringing it up so it's not something new to them. Because the new... Um, uh, group of medical students that are coming through are really excitable about this sort of stuff. And it's an opportunity to uh, train them. And, and then they're your new, because, you know, 
self-appointed leaders is that they will having them uh, know about all these stuff it will really help you to move stuff forward within an agency. No, thank you. Thank you. I I have a uh, I'm going to shift, a, but yet it's a perfect segue kind of thing. Um, so there are a lot of state leaders at the state level on the call, state mental health commissioners. And one of the best practices we know uh, for supported employment as well as supported education is to have that strong relationship between state mental health commissioners and voc rehab. Um, we're we're very aware of that, but I'm also wondering, in addition, and that top leadership piece is so important, right? It's got to, you got to have that. Could you speak to that level as well as who else a state mental health commissioner should reach out to, um, who should be at the table in a state to really do this well? I'm going to let Debbie go. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's all about the messaging. So, I mean, if you are at the state level, I mean, we have noticed this regarding, I mean, I can use the example, it's not support employment, but first episode psychosis. So how in the state of Texas, we went from two coordinated specialty care teams to now it being 29 of our 39 local mental health authorities. And we did that in less than 10 years, um, and most of them are at Fidelity, it's because we got champions at every single level. So we had built up champions in our state mental health authority. We built up champions in our CEO level. We built up champions at the legislature. Um, and uh, people took a lot of time talking about why this is important um, and one at another, adding more people to it. So it's just a really, really, really popular thing that everyone knows about it now. So like we're about to go into a new session and there I would doubt that there is a member who has that is not new that has not heard of it like they know about it. So it's taking an approach like that is that, you know, if at the state level, this is something you've decided that you value bringing on some CEOs that have figured out how to do it financially to talk through because I can say like when what I've found some of the experiences that have been the most successful me now where I sit as more of a consultant force at the agency was actually fully understanding the um the pain points for the CFO of like because the CEO is going to say I'm excited about this and the CFO is going to say no because they're concerned about it so you have to figure out like how to figure out some of those pain points so that there's less no's going on um and if you have figured out some ceos and cfos who figured it out bringing those in front of other people and just continuing to grow you know finding your champions and continuing to grow your champions yeah great and we know uh as you noted in your presentation, there are some states really doing a great job on this. And so uh, even within state, but there are also other states uh, to reach out to and uh, build that, I would say, support network, perhaps, um, you know, to, to learn from each other. Um, you know, we're just going to wrap up, but are there any last thoughts you have, any last recommendations you have for people on the line? I just want to say thank you for the time. And when the report comes out, please take a look at it. We put a lot of effort into really trying to capture the state of the science and practice in supported employment right now and then where it's going. And so there's some additional information about other special populations, such as people who are involved with the justice system and people who are um, navigating substance use conditions. We have some sections on that. We also have a lot more on virtual um, additions and integration um, into supported employment, there needs to be a lot more research there. It's happening um, in practice. People are using their smartphones a lot, but we don't have a lot of research saying this is actually helpful and why it's helpful. Um, but I definitely just please, we would love to work with you. As Debbie said earlier, we're really interested in that how CCBHCs are going to go about uh, implementing supported employment and and the eligibility criteria and how they're going to deliver it. And we're really excited about that. And so I just want to say, like, if y'all are looking for partners and people to help you make sense of things, we would be more than game. And we're just really excited to have been part of this. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much to all of you. This has been just very rich um, and we appreciate the work you're doing. And thank you very, very much.